Hi, this is Brian Choi, Managing Partner with the Food Institute, and welcome to the Food Institute podcast. This week, we are speaking with Dayton Miller, Managing Partner with Boulder Food Group, to get his views on the current state of the food and beverage market and how COVID has impacted the investment risk reward profile you know, in this space. But before we get started, if you are new to the Food Institute podcast and are listening on YouTube, we'd ask that you subscribe to our channel to stay current with our latest episodes and to like and share this video. This helps us expand our reach. With that said, I'll welcome Dayton to the show. How are you today? And uh, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and also about Boulder Food Group? Uh, great. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me, Brian. Um, pleasure to pleasure to be on uh, chatting with you. Um, uh, let's see. I guess uh, from a from a personal background, um, I've been with Boulder Food Group for about five years now. Uh, prior to that, uh, I had spent about five years building and, and ultimately selling my own natural products company. Um, and then in, in former lives prior to that, uh, I'd spent a number of years doing merger and acquisition work at the Walt Disney Company. Um, and it also spent some time in, in investment banking and, and management consulting. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I do feel like in, in some regards, a lot of those various experiences have really um, come together kind of nicely in, in terms of helping me with, uh, with what I'm focused on today. Uh, at, at Boulder Food Group, we're, we're an early stage uh, investment firm, um, mostly former operators who uh, are, are pretty comfortable investing early and uh, leaning in, in where necessary. Um, we had had some success doing this on our own prior to raising a fund, whether um, it was brands like Kavita or Evol and, and other businesses, and um, uh, have also been pretty fortunate to have good investors on our boards when when we were operators. So um, trying to trying to pay that forward, um, we're in the process of investing out of our second fund, and uh, in total have invested in in almost twenty businesses across uh, BFG one and, and BFG two. Great. And when you say early stage, um, how early stage? And in terms of like check size, what what what, what do you typically invest um, in these companies? Sure. So um, so from early stage, I mean, we like to see some revenue. Um, ideally, we want to see a, a pretty uh, clear path to a million dollars or more in in revenue. Um, a lot of times, businesses have that in uh, in or 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 more in, in trailing revenue and. Um, really, last year we we invested in a business with with twenty million of revenue, so it's a pretty wide range. Um, mm-hmm. And then our uh, size of investment um, also kind of uh, ranges uh, pretty significantly. The the first check in a business can be anywhere from two hundred and fifty thousand up to six million, um, and it can go up significantly thereafter as we do follow on investments and and continue supporting businesses through their growth. Got it. That's great. And in terms of, um, you know, the typical ROI that, that you're expecting, um, can you give a sense? I know every, every investment is different. Every company is different. Um, is there a, um, an ROI kind of hurdle that you're kind of looking for, um, you know, over the long haul? So let's say over the next two to five years. Yeah, it's a fair question. I think, uh, you know, we tend to think about uh, return and and risk together. Um, so, so I guess kind of just jumping back to like the stage of the business. Um, if we were investing in something that uh, doesn't have a million dollars in revenue yet, um, uh, certainly that feels like a typically like a very different risk profile than the business that I'd mentioned that has uh, twenty million plus in in revenue last year. Um, so if the risk profile is different, then the return expectations adjust accordingly. I, I think that's a, a, a non-answer and, and you know, candidly, <laughs> not probably not what I would be looking for if I were you. So I think the, the other way we think about that is, um, you know, in the, in the long run, I think our investors are looking for us to um, 3x their money over time. Um, I think if we if we do that, then then hopefully we're, we're earning the privilege to to, to raise a fund three um, uh, or, or get close to that. But, um, but yeah, that's how we, we kind of think about it. Yep. You think about it both in terms of a multiple of invested capital as well as um, uh, an internal rate of return. And the hold period on some of these businesses a lot is a lot shorter than others. And so 
um, the, 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 the multiple of invested capital would, would also change there too. Got it. That's, uh, that's very helpful. And, you know, as you know, there, there are many different types of, uh, of VC firms out there, right? So you have, you have some that are specifically focused on food tech, others more on, on consumer. Um, and so how does, how does BFE differentiate itself with, with some of these other, other VC firms? And, and I guess as a follow on, you know, what are some of the competitive, competitive advantages that BFG has? relative to these other VC firms? Yeah, I guess I, I would just start and I'd say, I think you're right. I think there are a lot of ca uh, options for capital out there and candidly, a lot of good options and, and entrepreneurs can and, and should do their homework when they're talking to investors. I think the, the, the best way is um, speaking to companies that are already backed by uh, these investment firms and um, really, you know, uh, seeing how they've leaned in and, and how they've been helpful um, to the, the investments that they've already made. Um, I'd say from BFG's standpoint, um, we, we like to think of ourselves as former operators who raised venture capital or private equity ourselves. Um, you know, what, what does that mean? Well, I mean, hopefully it means that we have a bit more empathy and, um, you know, it can be, can be different than living your life behind a desk. And I think it manifests uh, itself in our, in our style um, and, hopefully a more understanding way of relating to uh, some of the struggles and challenges and that it, that it takes for, for running a business. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we like to think that we have a lot of flexibility with our capital. So I'd mentioned, um, you know, the, the wide range of investments, um, uh, you know, the, on the low end, it's 250 K, but um, on the upper end, I mean, it can be 15 plus million um, over, over time. And, I think the, the unusual thing is we're really happy with both of those investment sizes and um, and, and 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 outcomes there. Um, uh, we we are very focused across com consumer packaged goods and better for you, and hopefully that means there's some synergy with respect to shared resources and problems, and um, ultimately leads to, to to growth accelerating. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that would be kind of how we, we like to think about positioning Boulder Food Group within the larger uh, ecosystem of, um, of Better For You investing. Great. No, that's very helpful. And, you know, as a, as a, you know, as a related question to this, and this is more talking about the, the food and beverage industry as a whole, you know, obviously we've seen these, these trends of Better For You, you know, you, you've seen the plant-based uh, you know, meat and alternative kind of meat categories, you know, huge growth. You see, we've seen kind of beyond meat and impossible foods getting hundreds of million dollars of capital. Um, and, you know, even, even, you know, last week we saw Peel Sciences, you know, get, uh, you know, get about $250 million being led by GIC and, you know, and that, that category of, of preservation and extending shelf life of produce, like that business is now currently worth over a billion, a billion dollars, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, can you share a little bit uh, of some of the trends that, that you're seeing and why consumers are moving towards this kind of better for you, ready to eat, um, you know, these, the, these types of food categories? Like what's, what's driving that change? Yeah, I mean, I think if there's one kind of positive thing that's kind of coming out um, from from COVID, it, it is uh, a longer term uh, appreciation um, and, and understanding of both the food system as well as the impact that that has on your overall health and, and well-being. Um, you know, we, we, we try not to kind of think too much about what's happening um, in the next uh, three months or six months or even year. And really try to take a much longer term approach and kind of focusing on the consumer. Um, and when you do that, I, I, I think things like um, plant based, gut health, microbiome, um, uh, all of that kind of underlying focus on immunity um, just continues to increase in, um, in, in importance. And I think, you know, we're not the only ones who are seeing that, of course. Um, Others are, are are solving that through innovation and, and really going after big ideas. Um, you know that the the appeal sciences um, business uh, I mean, to be able to do that and have it still be organic um, is a is a massive market opportunity. Um, ho hopefully, it's defensible um, for for the investor's sake and 
um, but it, it, no doubt it's solving a big problem. Yeah, are you seeing are you seeing some of the you know looking at it from a demographic perspective, right? So you know I would imagine that you know the the millennials and the Gen Z they're they're gra- they've already gravitated to you know to this whole kind of vegan you know better for you plant based meat kind of eating um, you know eating consumption patterns. Um, are you seeing that even kind of in the older generation, right? Like, are you seeing that in the baby boomer generation and and you know Gen X? For for sure, I think you know five years ago when we were starting investing um, in the sector, uh, the the kind of thought processes from going into various channels, um, maybe sequencing uh, retailers one after another, were, were very different than kind of what you're seeing today. Um, today, you know, Walmart is our number one customer for a, a couple of our brands. Um, five years ago, that just wouldn't have wouldn't have happened. Um, uh, and I and I think you're not only seeing it across mass, but club and um, uh, you know online as as well. Um, there there there's there's no doubt. Got it. Um, thanks for that. Um, and uh, you know you mentioned COVID, right? So you know obviously it's been all over the news. We've been all impacted working from, working from home um, and. Um, you know, what I'm seeing on, on, on my side here at the Food Institute, you know, a lot of businesses there, you know, they've been tremendously impacted. You, you look at food service, you know, I live in New York and there are restaurants over every corner that are just shut down. And in you know, all these news, these news articles about um, different restaurants and restaurant chains, especially on the independent side, getting impacted um, and some of which, you know, some of whom they're not going to be able to reopen. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, what have you seen amongst your portfolio businesses and, and, you know, how are you managing to, to um, advise, you know, your, the founders of, uh, of these, uh, of these companies about, you know, getting through the next three, you know, three to six months and then, you know, um, growing from, from that, from that point on. Yeah, I guess, you know, I would first just say you're, you're obviously right. I mean, the, the shift in spend here uh, is, is unlike anything I've ever ever seen, and um, you know you're seeing certain categories be up twenty to forty percent year over year, um, and that varies a bit depending on where you are in the grocery store. And then you have other uh, categories in the broader economy, whether it's dining out or uh, entertainment outside the home, that are that are down like eighty, ninety percent. I mean, right. Massive dislocation that you would um, never have been able to imagine a, a few um, short months ago. Um, you know, for the most part, we, we certainly consider ourselves very fortunate to be in a part of the economy that is still seeing demand as uh, consumer products investors um, largely uh, available at grocery. You know, th- those are essential businesses that were, were deemed to stay open and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, that said, we were. Uh, uh, in triage mode, just as much as everybody else out there. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, it was a focus on just overall budgetary support and cash liquidity. Um, you know, the uh, no, no matter what, I think cash is going to be tighter for at least the the, the next twelve to eighteen months. Um, and we we worked with our portfolio to extend runways, um, encourage expense decreases, and. Um, really, ideally, trying to figure out a, a runway to, till the end of next year, 2021. Um, I, I think you know one silver lining here is that uh, when when you do have a crisis like this, I think it can help provide clarity around uh, maybe difficult decisions or expense cuts that um, uh, may have been 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 more difficult if if you weren't operating from a um, this sense of urgency from a from a product strategy standpoint. We, um, uh, you know, we, we definitely are investing in better for you premium products. Um, it's really, uh, we try to do this regardless, but I think it just um, amplifies um, our focus on value proposition and what is the underlying value that you're delivering to the consumer. Um, it's one thing to have an expensive product. It's another thing to have one that's um, you know, delivering great value and it's expensive. Um, and so try to think about it that, like that, whether it's the you know, number of meals you're getting out of a particular bag um, or having various price points of entry for a brand. Um, 
especially more premium ones, um, smaller uh, single servings or trial sizes. Um, I think it was Mike Schneider at, at, at Nestle who um, was, was talking about how in the last recession, uh, premium and value did really well, um, but it was really that in between that was in trouble. So kind of thinking a lot about the um, almost like a barbell strategy uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to your, your product portfolio. And then you know, on the same, si- same side, um, just channel strategy as well. Um, uh, certainly the, um, the online uh, channel has been uh, uh, accelerated in a major way, um, both at Amazon and direct consumer. Um, we were fortunate to partner with uh, an Amazon sales and marketing agency about two and a half years ago called Cartograph. Um, mm-hmm. you know, they've seen record months, of course. Um, uh, but, but just the, the, how fast that market was changing. I mean, by the, um, day, if not, or at least by the week of whether you're allowed to advertise, whether, um, you know, certain, uh, goods would be shipped, um, in, in two days or not, um, because they, uh, certain, certain goods were given priority. So it's just such a fluid market. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, so it's obviously absorbing some of that purchases that would normally take place outside of the home. Right. Right. Interesting. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess, you know, from, from your standpoint, you know, as a, as a, as a venture capitalist and now, now that we're going through COVID and, you know, with all the uncertainties with where the economy is going, you know, the possibility that there could be another outbreak of COVID down, you know, later this year, you know, has Boulder Food Group's kind of risk profile, has that changed, right? So, you know, are you requiring, uh, you know, when you see prospective um, companies come forward and present their case, are you requiring it, um, them to be, uh, you know, further down the road in, ter- in, in terms of, you know, business development strategy and, and, and size? Um, and how are you kind of, how have things kind of changed for, you know, for you and your, uh, and your managing, other managing partner, Tom? Sure. I, I, you know, I, I'd say in short, um, it, it hasn't ch- changed dramatically. Um, the, you know, how we're doing diligence is definitely changing. I mean, we're obviously not able to, to meet with people in person like we were before. Um, and uh, so we are doing a lot more virtually. Um, that said, we, we, we certainly thought of ourselves as longer term investors and um, have always thought it's uh, difficult, if not impossible, to know where you are in a particular cycle. Um, and, I, and I think we do have a, a special appreciation for everything that can and does go wrong. Um, uh, you know, just shipping product and getting it onto store shelves is an accomplishment. And, and even when the pandemic is not occurring, um, you know, if a, if a business is doing a million dollars a month in revenue, and that's you know, 300,000 individual purchases that may have had to occur for a product that's around $3. It's um, uh, the, the, the numbers get really big really quickly. And so, um, you know, you, you do have some amount of comfort of just things constantly going wrong and, and never really getting a, getting a break as an operator. Um, you know, I'd say as a, as a relatively modest fund size, we do need to be cognizant of how much capital a business might need to get to the finish line. And for that reason, um, we, we've, uh, we, we've just always um, had a bit of a bias towards um, a more conservative approach. And there are definitely multiple ways to win, but um, certain strategies are just not really a fit for our fund size. And, um, uh, and, and, and so, you know, I don't know, it's a bit of a cliche, but we, we, we do tend to say, like, plan for the worst, hope for the best. Um, and in, in large part, that's just, um, you know, humility from, from having been in the industry for so many years and being surprised by what's worked and what hasn't. And, um, uh, you know, just knowing uh, how, how, many, how many things can go wrong. So, um, uh, I don't know, we, 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 that's how we, we tend to kind of see things. But, um, you know, no, no surprise, I think, from a, from a diligence standpoint, just kind of jumping back to that for a second, um, you know, strong margin profiles and, and demonstrated capital efficiency um, certainly get our attention even more than, than before. And um, a lot of that uh, is, a, is a way to kind of get a sense for uh, leadership at, at early stage businesses when you might not have a, a 
direct line to them or, or haven't been able to spend as much time with them in person, um, it's a pretty good litmus test for, for how things are going. Right. That's great. Um, one other question that I have for you, and this is kind of related to, to the whole risk um, question is, you know, looking out, you know, three to five years, you mentioned that Boulder Food Group, you guys have a long-term perspective. You know, what specific risks and, and, and related to that, what opportunities do you see in the food and beverage space as a whole? Um, you know, if you can just share a little bit about that, that would uh, that'd be very interesting for our, for our listeners. Sure. I think, um, you know, on the risk side, um, uh, if, if there's one thing that the COVID pandemic has highlighted, it's the importance of resiliency and um, you know, we've been trying to think about what, what does that really mean? And um, so I, I think it's supply chain diversification and, um, uh, and, and having multiple sources for uh, raw materials, for, for packing, et cetera, um, p- potentially supply chain traceability, um, knowing, um, you know, exactly which farm various ingredients come from. Um, you know, we think there's um, uh, certainly, you know, whether it's a risk or an opportunity, um, getting more transparency there um, uh, is, is is an area that we, we think could see some growth. Um, and it also just highlights the importance of channel diversification, uh, whether that's, you know, online club, mass, Amazon, et cetera. I think it would have been really hard to predict this. Um, uh, and the, the one way to kind of protect against um, unpredictable events is, is through diversification. Um, I think it's also highlighted just uh, especially over the last few years, how much focus there's been on the top line and, uh, and potentially not enough on the underlying unit economics. Um, you know, that, that said, I, I do think all of these risks um, in, in some regard do represent an opportunity to, to strengthen those areas and, um, uh, again, kind of come back to um, the focus on better for you um, as being, uh, being another um, area that, that we think has long-term um, opportunity, even though if you just look at like the last four weeks or even eight weeks data, um, people are, are comfort eating and focused on indulgence. Um, <laughs> right. you know, that, that said, I mean, it feels like people are eating a lot more meals as a family and there is, um, some balance from kind of the elimination of unnecessary travel. Um, and, and hopefully from that, it's a great time for innovation and new products and new business models to emerge. Great. Great. Um, you know, at the Food Institute there, you know, we have a pretty broad um, array of, of, of companies, right? We have we have startup companies all the way to billion dollar, um, you know, uh, diversified food companies, uh, manufacturers and importers. And, um, you know, as a, as a, you know, as someone who advises companies on strategy and, and growth and managing risk, you know, what are, you know, what's some advice that, that, you know, that you would give to, you know, to the members of our, you know, of our network on, on, on what they need to be thinking about now, um, you know, especially as we're moving, um, you know, into a post pandemic world, um, you know, what are, what are some, some uh, words of wisdom that you would give um, to, uh, to those executives? Sure. I think, you know, as, as we think about things, um, uh, from an early stage perspective, I, I, I think um, a lot of it applies to, to some of the larger businesses, too, as they think about launching innovation um, and really kind of minimizing your fixed costs uh, around that and, and running smart tests. Um, uh, now, with the, so many agencies out there, uh, you, you can really launch a product using um, it maybe, you know, Cartograph on Amazon. There's a business called Red Giant that is really great on the on the direct consumer side. Um, you know, branding, working with the, the, the folks that interact Boulder. Um, so you, you can really minimize your fixed costs and um, still get a product onto the market to see if it's something that consumers are interested in. I, I do think um, there's a, the, the dislocation now is a great time to either pivot or, or rein, reinvent yourself. Um, and if you take a long-term approach, focusing on the consumer, um, uh, and where that consumer will be five or 10 years from now, um, but still launching in a, in a, in a smart way. Um, I think, uh, I, I think it makes a, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I, I'd say the only kind of negative or, or something that, that I, I think about at least is that, um, it, it does perhaps, uh, take a mindset of 
accepting that innovation might not be margin accretive. Um, you know, in the in the past, I think um, you know there there was a lot of scale efficiencies from food, and um, I just think that's a, a lot harder when you're focused on resiliency and consumers are reading labels closely and questioning ingredients. So, um, you know, but that, that said, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I think, um, you know, going back to kind of the, the barbell strategy, I think you can have um, your, your core business as well as innovation and satisfy both consumers. And hopefully the, um, the, the innovation leads ultimately to a, a, another form of a core business. Great, great. Um, that's good. Uh, that's good advice. And so, um, so that you know, so that wraps it up for us. You know, at, at the Food Institute podcast this week, Dayton. Where can our listeners go and learn more about you and and Boulder Food Group? Sure. Yeah. Our um, our website is uh, bfgpartners.com, and uh, and my email is Dayton at bfgpartners.com. Uh, Would love to hear from your listeners and do whatever I can to to be supportive of the community. Great. We'll definitely share the relevant links in the description of this episode. So once again, I'd like to thank Dayton for his time today. Remember, if you're new to the Food Institute podcast, please follow, like, and share. If you'd like to learn more about the Food Institute, please take a look at the links in the description to learn more about us and what membership could do for you and your company. So until next time, this is Brian Choi signing off. 